out of chapter 49, which means we're in the middle of Jacob's blessings to his sons. He's already made uh, Joseph's sons, the ones born in Egypt, his own, and has blessed them. And now he is going to, now he's going through and blessing his, uh, if you will, his biological sons, the forebears, along with Joseph's two sons uh, of the uh, of the 12 tribes of Israel. One thing I failed to mention is um, Levi is, is you know, um, the forebear of the priests. And so Levi is not mentioned in these blessings. And in essence, what happens is um, there's not a blessing for Joseph, per se. There's a blessing for his two sons, and we talked about how that means that Joseph received the double blessing. And uh, Levi is taken off the table for this as well. And before we get to the next chapter, I want to call your attention to the um, map that I put in the comments. But we'll get to that in a, in a few moments. We left on, off with Zebulun. And one of the things that I neglected to mention was that the tribe of Zebulun settled on the Mediterranean coast near Sidon. Um, and that's why you have uh, the mention of its border shall be Sidon. So it's a, the Zebulun becomes a, a seacoast uh, tribe and a haven for ships. That's what... Uh, Jacob is saying there in verse 13. Well, let's move on. Verse 14 of chapter 49. Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. So what is Jacob uh, foretelling about Issachar's descendants, they're going to be a little um, passive and self-satisfied. And a donkey is a domesticated work animal. So he's basically saying, you know, they're going to become, Issachar is going to be sort of uh, subservient to other people and become uh, the subject of forced labor. I keep getting... Uh, prompts up here from Facebook. If you can let me know what the sound and uh, visual quality are, I'd appreciate that. But I'm just going to plunge on unless there's a, a major problem. Verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. Now let's just stop right there because this is very interesting. Dan is uh, the tribe from which Samson, uh, who I would probably argue was in some ways ancient Israel's mightiest judge, uh, he came from there. So you can see this kind of portrayal of Dan as as being a judge and being a pretty mighty person. Um, in my footnotes, um, it talks about, uh, it, it, it quote in, in my study Bible, it quotes uh, Sam, uh, Luther. It says, Samson was from the tribe of Dan. And Luther said, Samson fulfilled the blessing of Dan. So you can see how What's happening here is that these blessings are not just individual in nature. They are more communal in nature, referencing the descendants of the sons of Jacob. Now we have a, an interesting interlude at verse 18. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Um, I think, again, because of the communal nature of this um, poem, if you will, that these pronouncements by Jacob on his sons, 
that there is more to this than simply Jacob asking for personal salvation. Um, I think as we have seen this story unfold, Jacob is confident of his own salvation, but he is praying for the salvation of God's people and praying that God will do his work through these people. Again, my um, Lutheran Study Bible footnotes are interesting because it says, um, Jacob's brief prayer for salvation, interjected here, implies that his salvation is bound up in the future of his sons. The offspring of Abraham, that is the ultimate offspring, the Messiah, through whom Israel and the world are saved, would come from this family. And so you once again, you see this kind of telescoping uh, of Israel's entire historic mission uh, is being anticipated in these blessings and these prophecies from Jacob. This is a man who has been, who has walked with God, not perfectly, has been chastened and forged by God, and now is giving, because of his, his role as the last of the three patriarchs, he's giving, in essence, the charge to his people, uh, his people Israel, and their role in the history of salvation in the world. So he's saying, he's waiting confidently and with faith for the salvation of God. And notice he uses the term here, Lord, all caps there in verse 18. Once again, he's, he's invoking the name of Yahweh. 19. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. So we see that Gad is, a, um, and we'll see on the map in a few moments, it's a border country, a border tribe rather, and it's going to be the first line of defense uh, on one edge of Israel, um, the land that God gives to the people of Israel. And so they're going to be raided and they're going to raid back. It's the kind of their, their historic role. Verse 20, Asher's food shall be rich and he shall yield royal delicacies. Where Asher uh, ends up um, settling is um, um, in a fertile area. So the crops are very good. And so, um, also, the, there's an idea here of the kind of a kind of uh, um, well-being for Asher, a well-being uh, that that includes uh, safety and uh, income and food and the rest. Now, notice what he says about Joseph, verse 22. And, and and this is like maxing out what he just said about Asher. I'm sorry, I didn't I, I skipped Naphtali. Uh, Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. So what we see here are three consecutive brothers um, whose descendants will be fruitful. There will be a lot of them, um, and they will be prosperous, etc. Now, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you, by the mighty one who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. 
may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Set apart. That's a really important uh, idea. Uh, Joseph was, and Joseph is, is going to pick up on this very idea in the next chapter. Joseph was set apart by God for a particular role. And his people will benefit from this. Now, this also surfaces the biblical idea, uh, for want of a better term, of intergeneration, intergenerationality. Um, we can be hamstrung by what we receive from our parents, not just genetically and financially, but also in terms of how we were raised, how we were treated, um, what the people around us, uh, around our parents, our grandparents thought of them. Um, blessedly, God gives us fresh starts as we turn to him in Christ. Nonetheless, you know, we inherit sin from our forebears. And, um, and so what we see here is, you know, kind of an uh, enactment of what God says in Exodus, um, Exodus 20. Take a look at that real quickly. At the end of the Ten Commandments, I uh, know it's not at the end of the Ten Commandments. It is um, after, uh, it's in verse uh, 5, uh, you, oh, beginning at verse 5 of Exodus 20. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, that is, false idols. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And this is nothing more than saying that there can be consequences to the actions of previous generations on subsequent generations. Think, for example, of um, Germany. The people of Germany have a kind of schizophrenic attitude these days about their national identity. Um, on the one hand, they can point to Bach and Beethoven and uh, Luther and, uh, you know, great philosophers and great musicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then they also have this enormous elephant in the room of fascism, the, the Nazi uh, uh, if you will, the Nazi inheritance in a, in a sense, and the Holocaust, and then the subsequent division of Germany, and, you know, the fact that in the East, so many people still um, operate under the kind of burden of that, and then there's resentment in the West against the people of the East, the East because when the East began to be absorbed into the West, because of its inferior infrastructure, um, the unified German government decided to pour an enormous amount of resources into highways and, and other infrastructure uh, things uh, in East Germany. There's great resentment in the West about that. So my point is that the actions of previous generations have an impact on subsequent generations. Germans are almost afraid of anything like patriotism. I've spoken with um, many Germans uh, who have expressed to me they wish that they could feel, that they wish that they felt safe in feeling uh, the kind of um, patriotism that Americans often feel, but they have seen and uh, have been trying to shake off the shackles of 
patriotism turn to nationalism? Those are two different things. Patriotism is a love for one's country and appreciation for it, a certain pride in it. Um, on the other hand, um, a nationalism is a pride at the exclusion of others and a pride that says, well, maybe others who live within our borders really aren't part of us. That's what you saw in Nazi Germany. You know? So um, Einstein had to leave. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to be killed, etc., etc. So that past is something that still impacts their present. We have the same thing in this country, with the you know, with the the after effects of slavery, and the fear and the prejudice that still go with that to this day. So. The same thing happens within families, um, uh, and, and it can it can exercise a positive or a negative effect. I think of my father. My father it was the second of four children. Uh, he had three sisters. Um, they had to learn to take care of each other because. They were pretty much left on their own. Um, as my, my aunt told me one time, there was no love in the household in terms of um, love of the parents toward the kids. Um, I think that was particularly the experience of the oldest two. It was a gap. Uh, my father tells the story of returning home from uh, basic training and he knocked on the front door, which is kind of strange to me. I, at that point in my life, I would have just walked in the door. But he knocked on the door, and my grandmother, who was always good to me, by the way. I don't want to create a false impression here. Just the complexities of family life. But uh, she came to the door, and she said, oh, I guess you better come in. <laughs> And then she just walked into the living room. She said, Jim's here. And that was it. Well, fortunately, there was a, this is the positive aspect of it. There was a Lutheran couple down the road. My dad at that time, at that point in his upbringing, was living in the Springfield area. And there was a couple who just lived down the road. They had their own kids. And they were concerned about the spiritual welfare of my aunt and my dad. The younger ones uh, were either not around or just too young, uh, you know, for them to take on at that point. So they took my aunt and my dad to their congregation and they were baptized. Dad, I think, was about 11 years old, maybe and became a member of the choir and all of that. Now, when I was growing up, I didn't grow up Lutheran, but, you know, we went to church when I was younger. But when I became a Lutheran and I became a pastor, my dad just bust his buttons, uh, busted, burst his buttons. He was, uh, he was uh, really happy about that. But the point is, what might have happened had that couple not intervened in that? And that's my point. One generation can have an impact on another. And I think largely as a result of that experience, my dad um, made the decision when he was a boy that when he was a father, there would be love in his house. So you can see how um, these things can impact generation upon generation. And this is part of what Jacob is pointing to in these blessings. I didn't mean to make that a long excursus, but I wanted you to see how it happens both at a, a, a mega level, right, uh, in, in, in the lives of nations, but also in the lives of individual families. 
for good and ill. And this is why what parents do and grandparents do, um, why, that's why that's all so important. It's why Luther said the most important office in creation is the office of parent. Jacob was a far from perfect parent, right? But God kept working with him and he got it. And I know of many situations in which parents were not great with their kids, but as the years went on and they um, uh, became more uh, open in their relationship with Christ, the more their relationship with their children improved and you know it 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 was a a blessing to their children who had become adults so i'm not saying that uh, uh, genetics or experience are in prison are prisons because i believe that jesus christ uh, can step in and change lives as a, the word the gospel comes to us and we have the gift of faith our destinies can be transformed. Um, but let's not forget the importance of the impact of one generation on another, not just in our own experience, but in the experience of experiences of others. And if we can do that, we can be more charitable and more gracious toward others. And we can offer them the particular friendship that they need. Um, and the understanding that they need. I hope that all makes sense. Now let's finish with Benjamin, and it's kind of a downer. Verse 27, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. So uh, we see this motif of battle and struggle in um, the descendants of Benjamin. Um I'm taking a lot more time than I intend to, intended to do on this. I, I hope that's okay. Verse 28. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am, gathered, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah, the field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Now, if you were to create uh, what we've talked about before, an inclusio here, you would see that um, Jacob mentions in verse 29, gathered to my people, and then verse 33, after his death, says he was gathered to his people. Now, this is a very um, evocative phrase, I think, uh, because um, one commentator, the author of the One Volume Concordia commentary, says that in a way what this is saying is that Jacob just didn't go to die. He was gathered to his people, which is God's people. And the idea that this commentator says this conveys is that Jacob understood that death in this world was not the end for those who believe in the God we now know in Jesus Christ. Jesus picks up on this idea, you know, in the Gospels when he says, when the phrase that is used, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, when that's used, um, 
he's saying those people aren't dead because God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So the idea here, uh, if you bring these ideas together, is that um, Jacob is looking forward to something beyond death. He is gathered with his um, ancestors who have a living relationship with a living God. And um, what's very interesting to me is that he is buried with Leah uh, at this burial place. You remember Abraham bought that burial place. He insisted on paying for it after Sarah died. And um, so Abraham and Sarah are there. Isaac and Rebekah are there. And Jacob's going to be there with Leah. Leah... Uh, or yeah, Leah, Rachel, the one he adored, the one he loved, uh, the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, the one he slaved for under Laban, she's buried uh, in Bethlehem. And um, you would expect that he would have tried to have made some arrangements to be buried next to uh, Rachel. But instead, it's Leah. It's kind of a final vindication for poor Poor Leah. And uh, I find that interesting. There she is with the other patriarchs and their wives. And now we have a very poignant scene. <laughs> We've noticed uh, Joseph weep frequently in the book of Genesis. And I've talked about how that puts the lie to the notion that's extant among uh, some in the fundamentalist or evangelical camps saying oh, men are not supposed to show emotions. It's a sign of weakness. It's a, sh a sign of, uh, they would say, the feminization of uh, men. Um, and these, of course, people are not reacting to biblical uh, And these, of course, people are not reacting to biblical uh considerations, but cultural considerations, uh, they find their manhood threatened by strong women. We notice, by the way, among the patriarchs, they're not threatened by strong women. And Jesus certainly was not threatened by strong women. And um, um, Paul, who is often, I think, maligned as some sort of sexist creep, and I think he demonstrably was not, uh, also dealt uh, very equably and uh, readily with women. So, but at any rate, here we have Jacob. And every time, almost every time he weeps, it is a, a precursor to some level of reconciliation uh, or, um, yeah, some, some level of reconciliation in the story. Remember, he wept when his brothers were at the dinner. He wept when he saw his father and so on and so forth. Well, now Jacob dies and he weeps also. And I want to talk a little bit more about that as we get into this. But let's take a look at chapter 50, verse 1. Then Joseph's Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. Now this is really interesting. Um, the other two patriarchs were not embalmed. Embalming, of course, was an Egyptian practice. That's what they did with the pharaohs when they were mummified. And we can take from this, as some commentators do, for example, the New Interpreter's uh, commentary takes it as a given that Jacob was essentially mummified. And um, others have said the same thing. Um, uh, in the footnotes in the Lutheran Study Bible, it says that, um, according to the Egyptian custom, the organs 
would be, have been removed and the chest caf cavity was um, uh, filled with mixtures of salt, spices, and herbs to prevent decay. Um, now, what's interesting is I was watching a thing about King Tut uh, on Disney Plus, a National Geographic special the other night, and one of the archaeologists was saying that the usual practice was to leave the heart. Everything else would have been emptied out of the chest cavity to leave the heart because in Egyptian thinking, um, you needed the heart as you transitioned to another world, you know, and that's why they stuffed all the those items in the in the tombs of the pharaohs and so forth, uh, because they thought they'd need these things in another world. Um, at any rate, whatever the case may be, Joseph was embalmed according to the Egyptian custom at the order of Joseph, who was, after all, an Egyptian official at this point. The other thing that's interesting here is that the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. They had a 70-day period of mourning for Jacob. Now, this is extraordinary because the custom with the pharaohs, who, remember, not only were they the kings of Egypt, but they were also deemed to be gods, uh, deities, the mourning period for the, the pharaohs was 72 days. So this is a high honor being accorded to Jacob. Why? Because he is the father of Joseph, who is this kind of uh, uh, dreamer slash administrator magnificent who has saved Egypt from uh, uh, starvation, but has also fattened uh, the, the uh, property and the treasures of the Pharaoh. So this, these are high honors being accorded uh, to Jacob. Uh, take a look at Genesis 46, verse 4, real quickly. Genesis 46, verse 4. Joseph, um, or excuse me, Jacob is talking to Joseph and he mentions, no, I'm sorry, this is where Joseph goes back to, goes to Egypt to meet Joseph. And he says in verse four, I myself will go down with you to Egypt. He's talking to the other brothers. And I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. God's telling him that. I'm sorry, I really confused this. This is what God is telling Joseph. He's saying, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So the promise of God was that Joseph was going to be there at the moment of Jacob's death. And here we see its fulfillment in these first few verses of chapter 50. Verse Four, chapter 50. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. Now, this is very interesting because heretofore we have seen Joseph interacting directly with the Pharaoh. Here he says something to the household. And um, one of the um, commentators speculates, and I think this makes sense, be that because Joseph was in this time of mourning, he didn't go to the Pharaoh directly himself, but there were members of his household, the Pharaoh's household, who were jo with Joseph. And Joseph asked for this permission to fulfill the promise that he had made to his father about where his father's body would be buried. Verse 7. Um, excuse me, verse 6. And Pharaoh answered, go up and bury your father as he has made he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. Now, what I want you to see here 
is something that it, it, I mean, it's it's so deliberate and it's so interesting. What you see is a kind of um, exodus out of Egypt that is authorized by the Pharaoh and uh, in which Pharaoh's highest officials are all apart. It's, it marks a tremendous contrast between the relationship of Pharaoh and Egypt with God's people at this point in history against what existed 430 years later when they didn't even remember Joseph and they regarded the Hebrews and used the Hebrews as slaves. Um, the other thing to notice here as we go through this is that it's clear that the Pharaoh regarded Israel's claims on the promised land as legitimate. They recognized it. All right. Verse 7. Uh, I'm in the middle of it, uh, but I'll begin at the beginning again. Joseph. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh the elders of Pharaoh's household and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the household of Joseph, his brothers and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen, this you know, great fertile area that the Pharaoh had given to them. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and there you think of the chariots and the horsemen chasing after um, Moses and the other Hebrew slaves who were uh, escaping in essence after the Pharaoh begrudgingly gave them permission to leave. And then, of course, remember Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of that era changed his mind and sent the armies chasing after uh, God's people and God delivered them at the Red Sea or the Reed Sea. So it's a, quite a contrast. Middle of verse 9. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he, that is Joseph, made mourning for his father seven days. Now we do not know why they went to the threshing floor of Atad. We're not even exactly sure where it is. But um, what's interesting about this passage is that uh, Joseph makes mourning for his father for seven days, which if you look at 1 Samuel verse, uh, or chapter 31, verse 13, is the prescribed number of days for grieving for ancient Israel. So Joseph not only observes the Egyptian mourning for his father, but as they go back to the land that God has promised to his people and they have this uh, ceremony of lamentation at the threshing floor of Atad um, uh, he also observes the Jewish uh, uh, prescription for mourning seven days verse 11 when the inhabitants of the land the Canaanites saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad they said this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was called Abel Mizraim. Well, Mizraim, you'll remember, is the name for uh, Egypt. Um, and so the idea here is the, the meadow or the mourning of Egypt, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G of Egypt. They came to call it that. Um, it is beyond the Jordan. Thus, his sons did for him that is, Jacob's sons did for him as Jacob had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. Now this is uh, what we see at this point is after this period of time at Atad, the Egyptians went back, the sons remained to fulfill their uh, Joseph's promise to Jacob. Verse 
14. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. So they go back. Uh, you know, they didn't necessarily have to, uh, but they do go back. Now, it is 945, and I think I want to try to complete this chapter if you want to hang with me for a few more minutes, if that's okay. And then we'll start something new next week, and I don't know what it's going to be yet. Now comes this incredibly poignant scene. Um, and I've, I've read some commentators just, I think, doing gyrations and dances around this, and I actually think the explanation for it all is really straightforward and simple. So let's go on chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us, and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And now several things about this passage. First of all, something I have said over and over again and now I'm persuaded that I may have been wrong. I ascribed um, lying to the brothers. But we do not know whether or not Jacob spoke with the brothers and told them that uh, he didn't want Joseph to hold anything against the brothers for selling him into slavery. He may very well have said that. Or he may very, the, the brothers may very well have read between the lines as to the intentions of their father without him overtly saying this. Whatever the case may be, to me the real poignant thing about this incident is this. The brothers found it hard to accept being forgiven. Joseph had already assured them of his forgiveness and his love. But you know, when parents die, uh, children sometimes relate to each other by and large because of their parents. And after the death of parents, sometimes those relationships can become embittered, they can become problematic, and um, so maybe not only did the brothers find it hard to accept grace, which I think is the most important thing going on here, but they also saw the changed situation with their father's death, and that is pointed to when it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. Um, a few weeks ago, it was interesting, um, after Sunday service, I was coming to the end of my, I had, I had earlier come to the end of my sermon, and um, I said, so I think there are two things our Lord want to tell, wants to tell us here today, right? 
And I went on to talk about the two things that I thought our Lord was telling us in this passage. And just at that moment, uh, one of our little ones had escaped from the nursery and run into the sanctuary. And for people on one part of the sanctuary, it was a little difficult to hear. So I had a fellow come up to me after the worship service and he said, what were those two things you wanted to say? <laughs> and I talk, talked with him and I said, you know, basically it boiled down to this, grace, grace, grace. We are graced by God in Christ. And he said, you know, grace can be so hard for us to accept. We can never hear it enough. And I think that's true. And Joseph's brothers, the idea that their brother, by the power of God and the love of God and his faith in God working in him, would be able to forgive them, it almost was too good to be true. And so, whether or not Jacob directly said, Joseph, you've got to forgive your brothers, and every parent wants their kids to be reconciled, right? Um, you know, whether or not he said that directly or not, uh, it probably was the intention of Jacob. But more importantly, the brothers had, had allowed their guilt to become shame. You remember, I've talked about the, that before. Guilt is a legitimate emotion that drives us to repentance and to God's grace in Christ. Shame is when we think that what we've done defines who we are and that we're too bad for anyone, including God, to ever forgive us. And we have to do good things in order to be forgiven. And we see that shame also here by the brothers. They come down and they fall down before him. One commentator stated very emphatically, and I agree, that this is not what Joseph foresaw in his visions as a boy. Because this comes not out of a mistaken identity. In other words, uh, uh, people coming to uh, 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 a kingly figure, which is how the brothers of Joseph would have viewed him initially because they didn't know it was Joseph. These are um, people who feel ashamed, who think they need to do something, make themselves the slaves of someone in order to receive forgiveness. Remember Jesus says to us, I no longer call you my slaves, but my friends. And that's what, the, what forgiveness and that's what grace works. So the brothers find this grace and forgiveness just too good to accept. But Joseph, who has this faith in a gracious God, who has um, delivered him through all of the horror, horrors he's gone through, um, he understands the depths of God's love and is empowered to forgive and is simply grateful to be reconciled uh, to his brothers. Now, this has implications for the church as well. Who are uh, the people of our church? They are our sisters and brothers in Christ. Uh, there should be no grudges. There may be confrontations for sin and slights, but there cannot be grudges in Christ's church. Those have to be let go of. And you know, the, the common Greek New Testament word for forgiveness is aphiemi, meaning release. So Joseph, uh, the moment that the brothers offer their slavery to him, releases them from that. And I want you to notice uh, there's an inclusio here again in, verse, in verses 19 and 21. Joseph begins by telling the brothers, do not fear. And then he says in verse 21, so do not fear. And that is what's going on with them. Joseph's response is interesting. First of all, he says, don't bow down to me. Am I God? I'm not God. And this is exactly how you remember Peter responded when Cornelius's household fell down to him. And he said, rise, I'm not God. I'm a man. I'm preaching the gospel. 
And the same thing with um, uh, Paul and, is it Silas? I can't remember. But anyway, people were bowing down to them. I'll give you the citations so you'll know what they are. Acts 10, 25 to 26, and Acts 14, 11 to 15. So Joseph responds in three ways here to the brother's plea. First of all, he says, I'm not God. And then he says, what the brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. That's not to say that God said, Joseph, you've got to go through this bad thing. It's that God is able to use bad things for his good. Turn real quickly to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. This is part of the most magnificent chapter uh, in, in, I think, in the New Testament. Romans 8, 28. Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, there is evil in this world. And God does not impose evil upon us. But evil can be done to us, either because of our own sin, or because of the world, or because of the devil. Evil was done to Joseph. He acknowledges that his brothers did evil. Look what he says in verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In other words, God took what was evil and, meant it for, and, and made it something for good. And what was the good? He goes on in verse 20, to bring, about, bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So this is a motif that runs through Scripture. The greatest example of it in the whole of Scripture is Good Friday. Now, why in the world do we call a day when the Savior of the world was killed, good. Because God brought good out of evil. Hmm? The good was, first of all, that Christ paid the price for our sins and opened uh, uh, the pathway to a relationship uh, with him through Christ. I and the Father are one, Jesus says in John 10.30. And in John 14.6, he says... Uh, um, that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And so Matthew tells us about the curtain of the temple being torn in two. The Holy of Holies is no longer obstructed, but we have direct access through uh, to God through Jesus Christ. So the first good is that there is reconciliation between God and humanity that happens on Good Friday. The second thing that comes out of it is that God raises him from the dead on the third day. And in raising him from the dead, he also opens up eternity to all who believe in him. God made good out of what was evil. The human race had fallen into evil. God gave new life through Jesus Christ. Humanity decided that they were going to kill off God and throw off uh, God's authority from uh, over their lives. And instead, what happened is that they were liberated by God as Jesus breathed his last. God bring good out of evil. Joseph sees that. And that's part of why he can be so magnanimous. And why he tells his brothers, do not fear. Which, by the way, remember, it always comes at the beginning of theophanies, whenever an angel or God appears to someone, or when uh, Jesus uh, appears in his resurrected body. He says, don't fear, do not be afraid. Right? So uh, Joseph is speaking on behalf of God here. You should not be afraid because, first of all, I'm not God. Secondly, you should not be afraid because I understand that God's hand was in all of this. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And thirdly, the thing that Joseph says in his response is that his brothers and their families 
will be cared for. So don't be afraid. As long as Joseph is alive, he will ensure that his family is taken care of. Not just because they are his family, but because they are the people of God. And he has been given that role. I am almost done here, so hang with me for just a few more moments. So I think that's very important. I think uh, uh, Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21 are the money verses of the whole book. And they point to the way God is going to work in history. And there's a reason why these people are being saved. They are being saved for you and me so that the Savior could come through them. Verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to his Abra to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So what's Joseph foretelling? God is going to come to the people of Israel, and he's going to lead them out of Egypt into the promised land. But there's more to this as well. The idea that God is going to visit us also has to do with the coming of Jesus Christ. The epiphany of God among us in Jesus Christ. This is, Joseph may not have fully understood it. The prophets don't often always understand everything they're saying, but they're speaking for God. And so Joseph is foretelling all that is to come here as he dies. Verse 25, Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So, Take my dead bones to where you go. Take me to the promised land. Verse 26. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And there's nothing about mourning, nothing like we saw with Jacob. And isn't that an appropriate way for someone with a servant's heart uh, for the account of them to end. No grandiosity. He's had grandeur in life, but it didn't, it wasn't important to him. Only in so much as he was able to save people. That's what he says in 50 verses 19 to 21. So you can see, again, Joseph's not perfect, he's a human being, but you can see in Joseph a Christ figure right? It's not important. I had a conversation with the bishop the other day, and we were kind of talking about, uh, you know, getting older and, and having left other congregations and, you know, that kind of stuff you talk about uh, when you're older and you've been around the block a few times. And he said, yeah, you know, maybe someday someone will say, I kind of remember that Daniels guy. I kind of remember that Selbo guy. And we both agreed it didn't matter whether we were remembered, right? What was important to Joseph was that God was honored. And um, that's what should be important to us. We know we're already taken care of. We belong to God because of Jesus Christ. We, we are graced we are part of his eternal family right now because we can confess Jesus Christ as our Lord. So how the world views us isn't really that important. Now, I'm not saying we sometimes don't think about those things. We do. <laughs> we're human. We're, we're saints and sinners. But in the final analysis, the honors of the world don't matter anything. It may not matter at all. What matters is that we have trusted in Christ and that we will one day hear him say, Come, blessed of the Lord, into my kingdom. Come into the kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, that's all that matters. Okay, uh, just point out to you in the comments, 
where the 12 tribes uh, were. You can see why Simeon got absorbed into Judah. It was in the midst of Judah. And um, you can play around that with that, looking at the end of Genesis. And also, uh, if you take a look at Exodus, you'll see uh, the significance of that. Okay, I am uh, done. I, I know I ran a little longer than usual, but um, I hope it was worth the wait, uh, worth getting through this uh, magnificent, magnificent book. And um, I've enjoyed going through it with you. Um, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book. But more than that, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would use our encounters with your word to build up our faith and give us the same kind of passion for the needs of others that we see in Joseph. Help us to love you and to love others completely. And help us as sisters and brothers in Christ to love one another as Christ has loved us, as he commands us, his people. Father, we pray that you would use us to share the gospel with the world, that all people might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and King, and live in the confidence and peace of your grace. And Father, help us to pass that on. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very, very much. God bless you. Yeah, I think that's a good blessing to end with tonight, Ken. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. So, I don't know what it's going to be, but I will uh, plan on being with you on Tuesday night. If you've got any ideas, just send them my way. God bless. Bye now.